This video is going to walk us through our first problem on the regression lab. So this first case is regarding cigarette smoking and birth weight. So the first thing we want to do before we even get started is we want to go to our graphing calculator and we're going to delete any equations that we might have stored in our y equals screen. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and just delete those equations that I had previously in my y equals. Then I'm just going to do to the second quit to go back to the main menu. The other thing I want to do is to clear any lists that I may have had in this calculator, um, especially if you had a friend maybe that used it or if you used it in a stats class. Now keep in mind, if you have lists that you need for a class, then don't do this command. Otherwise, we want to do the second button and we're going to go into the catalog and you can see in blue right there, so second catalog. Right now the calculator is on an alpha lock. You see that A in the upper right hand corner. So I can hit any letter and it'll jump down to that point. So I want to hit the C, so the program button for clear all lists. And then I just want to arrow down until I see that. So there it is, clear all lists. And I'm going to hit enter and enter again. And the third and final thing I want you to do is go back into the catalog, so second, zero, and we want to jump down to the D's. We're going to turn diagnostics on. So it's on alpha lock. I'm going to jump down to the letter D. So I'm going to hit this little X to the negative one power button. And I want to arrow down until I see, there it is, diagnostic on and hit enter. Okay, so we cleared equations out of the y equals, cleared all lists, and we turned our diagnostics on, something that we'll need uh, a little bit later. So the first thing we want to do is we want to enter the number of cigarettes per day into list one and birth weight in pounds into list two. So you're going to hit your stat button and then you're going to hit enter right there on edit. We want to edit a new list. So I'm going to arrow over here to list one and I'm just going to start to type in my data from list one. So 22, enter, 16, enter, 4, 19, 42, 8, 12, 30, 14, 16, 5, 20, 32, 2, 15, 48. Then I'm going to arrow to the right for list 2 and enter the birth weight. So 6.4, 7.2, 8.1, 9.5, 10.5, 11.5, 12.5, 13.5, 14.5, 15.5, 16.5, 6.6, 6.0, 7.9, enter. And then I'm just going to second quit. So after we've entered our data, that's what we just did here for number one in list one and list two, I now want us to set an appropriate window for my data because we're going to look at the plot. So we're going to go into window and what we want to look at is the X data ranges from smallest value 2, largest value 48. So I think a good range is actually what I already have right here is going to be an X min of 0 and an X max of 60. And then for the Y's, uh, you know, this is birth weight. So I think just going from 0 up to 10 pounds, I don't see anything over 10. So 0 to 10, and you can leave the other kind of the x and y scale at 1. That's just the kind of the increments along the x and y axis. So there's our appropriate window. Now we want to go into stat plot and turn on that plot. So in our stat plot, that is right here. It is the second button, and then where we normally hit y equals, that activates the stat plot. So we're going to do second y equals, and we're going to hit enter on that first plot. 
Right now it's highlighted as off. I want to hit enter to turn it on. I do want that scatter plot and that's what's already selected. And then right now mine is exactly like I want it. X list from list one, Y list from list two. If yours is off, just go down and you can get to list one by doing second and you can see it right here on the number one. So second one will give you your list one there. And then for list two, you could do second list two if it wasn't already set to, to be those lists. And now let's go ahead and just take a look at that graph. So as we look at this graph, we can see the you know, downward trend as the number of cigarettes per day increased, the birth weight of the babies decreased, and we just see an overall downward trend to the data. So what regression is going to do is it's going to fit whatever type of a equation, we're going to start with linear, it's going to fit a linear equation to that trend of data. So that's what we're going to do here on number four. We're going to fit a line, a linear model, linear regression, all essentially saying the same thing. We're going to fit a line to that data set. So again, let's just second quit to go back to the main menu. So to perform regression, it's very straightforward on our calculator. You want to hit your stat button again, and we're going to make it do a calculation. So we're going to arrow to the right to the calc menu, and you see it right down here on number four, that's the Lin regression. So again, there's some notes here on your paper to remind you but we're going down right there to number four. You can either arrow down or you can just hit the number four and then hit enter. Now what we want to do, and you can see it right here on your paper, we want to tell it where to take the X data, where to take the Y data, and then where to store the equation. So we tell it the X data is in list one, and we do that by hitting the second and list one is right there in blue, number one, then comma above the seven. The Y data, we're going to tell it, is in list two, and that's right there at second, number two. And then the last thing we do, and this is really handy, this is crucial, we're going to tell it to store this equation into our Y1 equation. So we've done this in class a few times. That's where you hit the variables menu or the VARS menu. And then it's a Y variable, so we are going to arrow to the right to Y vars. And it is a function, so we hit enter, and then we want it in Y1, so enter again. Okay, that's exactly what I want to see, and then I just hit enter. If you have a new version of the TI-84 that looks a little bit more like this one, the TI-84 plus CE, I want to go through and show you, so I'm interrupting the video and, and inserting this part of the video, because um, your regression will look just a little bit different, but once you see it, you should be fine for the rest of the, the original video. Uh, so I still have the same data in list one and list two, and I'm still going to go into stat, and I'm still going to arrow to the right to calculate, and I'm still going to go down to linear regression, and again, you can either do number four or number eight. It just I don't know really honestly why they have both of them in a graphing calculator. It's just a different way, AX plus B versus A plus BX. Uh, we're just going to go to number four, the typical AX plus B. And then by default, um, it's showing I want my X list from list one. That's perfect. I want my Y list from list two. That's perfect. You will omit this frequency list. That's if you had like one value that was being used repeatedly and you would enter that in a different list, but we don't have that. So for all of the examples you do, this is about the only thing that's different on your calculator. Um, you won't have anything there. And then this is actually prompting us to say store the regression equation. And this is where we want to go into variables, arrow to the right to Y variables, hit enter there on function, and then enter on Y1. So we're going to store equation into Y1. And then you just go down and hit calculate. And now we're at the same information that you would get on your other calculator. So here is my linear regression equation. So we're going to go ahead and, and write that um, in number four. So we're going to write in for A, the coefficient, and then in for B, the appropriate constant. So Y equals the A is negative 
four decimals I think is enough to write here. X and then plus the B value is 8.439 and if I go to four decimals again I guess I'd round the six up to a seven. So we're rounding off some values here but the entire decimal expansion is already stored in Y1 so we don't have to worry about that for our future calculations. I also want you to write in this R squared value. It has a little blank right here and that is about 0.78 and again I guess I'll go to four decimals, one nine. We're going to talk about this R squared in, in just a little bit but for right now let's just record it right here in number four. Now what I want us to do, we've performed the regression, we've written it down. Let's take a look at that graph. So before we even look at the graph I want you just to see that if you hit Y equals you can see that that entire equation with all the decimals is stored into Y1 so that's great. Now let's hit graph and look at our data with the line. So that looks pretty good. I mean I've, I can see that the the lines, you know, fitting the data as best it can and it really is reflecting that, that downward trend to the data. So we've taken a look at our, at our data, it all looks pretty good there. Now what we want to do on number six is we want to use the equation to predict the birth weight to the nearest tenth of a mother who smoked 55 cigarettes per day. So right now I believe I set our window, so let's go back and hit window, to just go from, oh good, we did, we went from zero to 60. I didn't remember for sure how far out we went. So that will encompass the, the 55 prediction. If I had only went to 50, I was gonna extend that out uh, a little further, but we're good here. So let's go back to the graph. And there's two places that we can tell our calculator to make this prediction for us so we don't have to actually do the work of plugging in 55 for X. And one is right here on the graph. So all you want to do within the graph feature, we're going to make it do a calculation. And so we're going to go seconds and then the trace button. And we want a value, so enter. And we want the value at x equals 55. So what we end up with rounded to the nearest tenth is going to be four point, you see it at the bottom there, eight, eight. So rounded to the nearest tenth, about 4.9 pounds. Now the other way you could have gotten that uh, value of 4.88 is back on the main menu. So we just second quit to get out of the graph. It is kind of nice though to see it on the graph and actually see where that value would be and kind of make sense with what we might have guessed just looking at the data. But if we were back on the regular screen here, we could also do what you've seen me do and hopefully you've been doing in class is since it's stored in that Y1 we can call up essentially function notation. So it's the idea of making it do Y1 of 55 just like we would in a, in a function notation for F of 55. So hitting variables, write for Y variables, enter on function, and it's in Y1, so enter on Y1, and then function notation, parenthesis, 55, close parenthesis, hit enter. And there it is, so either, either location. So we have a prediction, looked reasonable on the graph, and kind of makes sense that that would be going down a little bit there. Now what we want to do is we're going to fit a quadratic or a degree two polynomial uh, to this data set. So when you look back at your graph, you know, the linear reflects the trend well, but you know, maybe it might look a little better if we fit some sort of a degree two polynomial. Maybe it might do a better job of reflecting or modeling that data. So in order to do this, and you'll have to do it on the next couple of problems on your own, second quit, back to the main menu. Again, it's under the stat button, arrow to the right, because we're going to make it do a calculation. And now we want it to do a quadratic regression, so it's exactly like before, but it's just grabbing number five instead. So I'm just going to hit number five. Again, I want to tell it where to get my X and Y data. 
So x data is in list one, so second list one. Again, this is all reminders right here in your document. And then comma, the y data is in list two, so second list two. Comma, this time I'm gonna store it, because I don't wanna lose my line. I'm gonna store it in y2. So variables, y variables, function, but this time number two for storing it in Y2. And then hit enter. All right, so here's the A, B coefficients for the X squared, the X term, and then the constant C. So let's go ahead and write that in our Y equals our regression equation for this quadratic. Here's something to be careful of. I know it comes up on one of the exercises you're gonna do on your own. You need to recall this E negative four is scientific notation saying this number, 5.5, .5, times 10 to the negative fourth. So that means move your decimal four places to the left. So when I move my decimal four places to the left, one place to the left would put me in front of that first five, but I need three more moves, so I had to tack on the three zeros here. So point zero 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 five five, and I'll stop there. Again, it's all stored, so x squared, and then the b, so minus point zero nine one around the three six up to four there. So point zero nine one four x. And then the constant there, the C is plus 8.6576. So again, you know, four or five decimals, um, that's, that's sufficient for just what we're writing here. Again, let's record this R squared. It's a point seven nine three one. We're gonna come back to discussing that in just a little bit. And so now we have our quadratic regression all written down here. And we want to now go back and take a look at the y equals. Let's just make sure, yep, it's stored in there in y2. And now if you want to turn off and you don't want to see too much on your graph, you can arrow to the left at that y1 if you want to turn off the line. So if you just hit enter on the equal sign, it turns it off and now only the quadratic will graph. So just so we're not seeing too much at once on the graph for right now. So let's go ahead and hit graph, take a look at it. Okay, there's the data with a degree two polynomial. Looks pretty similar to the line. You see the slight curve. Looks like it's starting to flatten out over here a bit, probably indicating if we extend and look at the plot, maybe it's starting to approach the vertex of that parabola. It is a positive leading coefficient, so eventually it is going to turn back up. Um, but within the data itself, it looks pretty similar to, to the line here, just within the original data. So we've seen the graph on the scatter plot. Okay, again, there's the two locations for making a prediction. So we can either do it right here on the graph, or you can go back. It's up to you. You can go back to the main menu. But if you go back to the main menu, you would now need to do y2 of 55. Okay, so let's take a look at it both ways. So off of the graph, you can do second calc. It's a value at 55. And so at 55, we see the prediction according to the quadratic model is rounded to the nearest tenth, 5.3 pounds. You know, a little bit more than the prediction that we got according to the linear model. So again, looking at it just visually, I mean, it's not too far off from the, the downward trend of the data point, so still probably uh, a reasonable prediction at that, at that point. And so again, the other way you could have gotten that prediction from the equation, let's second quit, back on the main menu is the variables write for y variables, enter on function, but this time we're in our quadratic model in y2, and you could have done y2 of 55. And again, obviously same, same value that we get there. All right, on the next page, we're gonna do this one more time, so I'm 
kind of going through a, a good range of what you're going to have to do um, on the next couple of ex examples that you have to do on your own, you're going to end up having to do linear, quadratic, and lastly, a cubic regression. So for a cubic regression, basically same approach. Again, the key strokes are here. So we want to go into stat, arrow to the right to calculate. This time we're not doing linear, we're not doing cubic, or I'm sorry, we're not doing quadratic, we are doing the cubic. So we want to go down there to number six or just hit six, but that's the one we want. We hit enter, but again, we want to tell it where to get the X and the Y data, and then this time we'll store the cubic equation right here in Y3. So let's see, uh, X data is in list one, second number one, Y data is in list two, second number two, comma. Now let's store it in Y3, so variables, right to Y variables, enter on function, but this time we want to store it, because I want to keep the other two, I'm going to store it down there in Y3. So down to number three and hit enter, looks good. And here are all my coefficients for the cubic model. So let's go ahead and, and write this in. So we have, again, some scientific notation that we better uh, keep an eye on here. E negative five, that means moving the decimal five places to the left. So I'm going to need four zeros because one place puts me in front of the six. So I'm gonna need point and then four zeros there. And then it's, you know, a six, one, that's, that's enough just for writing it. And that's my coefficient of my x cubed. Coefficient of my x squared is minus 0 0.0038 x squared. And the coefficient of the x term right there, the c, minus 0 0.0105 x. And lastly, the constant right there, plus 8.0. 3.26. Again, let's record this r squared. We're going to get to that in just a minute here. This r squared, again, I guess I'll round it to four decimal places there, so 0.8115. The r squared is going to give us some quantitative data, a, a way to look at how well a equation or a model fits the data. We're so far just kind of looking at it and um, kind of describing what we see graphically, but we are going to want to tighten that up a bit. So that's what we're going to look at in just a moment with the R squareds. Again, let's go ahead and go back into Y equals. Let's turn off the quadratic. So let's enter on the equals in Y2. Let's go down and take a peek. Yep, there's the cubic stored into Y3 and it's on. So let's just take a look at that graph. All right, so as we look at the graph here, we see something a little bit different in terms of the data that we saw with the linear. We were starting to see it a bit with the quadratic. We sensed that the quadratic model was starting to flatten out a bit, but this one's making one of its turns. We know a third degree polynomial would have a couple of turns in it. This one's doing it pretty quickly after the original data ends. Again, within the original data, looks pretty close to what we saw with the line and, and with the quadratic. Seems to do a nice job of estimating and, and modeling that data, but it is making this turn awfully quickly right after that last data point. So we're going to, again, use this to make a prediction for the uh, mother who smoked 55 cigarettes. So again, right here on the graph, we can do second calc or calculate, hit enter on value, and type in 55. And there we see about 6.3 pounds. The other option, I won't go through it this time, but would be back on the main menu to call up Y3 and then evaluate at 55. And of course you would get the same thing, about 6.3 pounds. Now, when we look at this, you know, just logically looking at 6.3 pounds and then also looking at it graphically, I don't know how I feel about that. I don't think that there's any reason to suggest data-wise that, you know, the decreased trend all of a sudden 
mothers start smoking more cigarettes than whatever this last data point was, I think it was around 48, and then their babies start having higher birth weights when they start smoking a lot more cigarettes, doesn't really seem reasonable here. And that's a really important thing to think about when we're going to be looking at, in our last question here, the fit of the data. So there we are, we're at our last question. Discuss the fit of all three models. Well, there's a couple things I wanna point out. You have a document that's up on D2L and it can be very helpful with recalling everything we've done here and it's regression on the TI-8384. There's an overview. It was borrowed with permission from a, another professor's website, but it's a great reference. So it goes through essentially the things we've done here. They also have a nice little section here on interpreting the results, how good is the fit. And we're told here that this R-squared that we've been recording is called the correlation coefficient or the coefficient of determination. And essentially what we want to realize is the R-squared will always be in between 0 and 1, so it takes on values between 0 and 1. And the higher the value, the better the fit. So one would reflect a perfect fit, so going through every single data point exactly. So you can get a lot more involved in your interpretation of R squared if you took a statistics course. But for our purposes, I just want us to know that the R squared varies between 0 and 1. The closer it is or the higher the value, closer it is to 1, the better the data um, is represented by that particular equation. Now, some examples, and you might have one of these in the next two problems that you do, some examples could be extreme. For example, here's something I had in a different class. It was an example involving uh, modeling average temperature data in Elgin, and you can see the data here. And I could make my calculator or in this case it was Excel, but I could make a calculator fit a line to the data, but that just looks silly. I mean, why would I fit a line to this data that so clearly has a, a curve to it? A line just doesn't even look good for you know, predictive purposes. However, a calculator will do it, but notice how low that R square is, uh, 0 0.06. So that's an extremely low R square. Remember, it varies between 0 and 1. That's pretty close to 0, 0 0.068. So this would be an extreme case, just showing you how ridiculous it is to try to fit a line to this curve data. If I went on to fit a more appropriate choice of either a squared quadratic or a cubed model, I can see it seems to reflect the data better. And also those R squareds bounce way up to 0.94 and 0.97. So one of your exercises may be something very extreme where visually you see that one model really does a nice job of fitting the data and the R squared is very high here versus looking at that data with something that doesn't even look logical and the R squared being extremely low. But that is not what we have here in this example. In fact, if I go back into my y equals, I'm going to go ahead and turn all three equations on. So I hit enter on the equal signs on y1 and y2. I'm going to hit my graph. Well, as we look at that data, I mean, it's almost indistinguishable within the domain of the original data set. After that, then it starts to vary a little bit. So let's try to summarize these thoughts a little bit and discuss the fit of all three of these models. So one of the first things that you should always think about is just what we've been doing the whole time is what happens when we visually look at the data. So here, visually, the graphs of the three models over the interval of the original data. So when we look at the models kind of just within the original data, like right in here. Okay, so when we look at that, 
all seem to model the data reasonably well. Okay, just to kind of look at it, they all do a pretty good job, almost a very similar job, just kind of within the domain of the original data. Now, quantitatively, so we're going to get into using that R squared. So quantitatively, when, say, looking at the R squared values, when looking at the R squared values, um, I don't know, I guess I could say there are minor, real minor gains in going from the linear model. Now, if you remember looking back, the linear model had an R squared of 0.78 about. So the linear model I'll even put that in parentheses here. R squared was about 0.78. So going from the linear model uh, to the quadratic model, and that had an R squared on the quadratic model of about 0.79, real minor gain there. And then up to the cubic model, and that cubic model right up above has an R squared of about 0.81. So basically this means that the quadratic model fits the data I guess I'll just say a small bit better than the linear model and the cubic model fits the data a little better than the quadratic model. So because these R squareds are getting a little bit higher each time, a little bit closer to one, technically the quadratic model does a little better fit and the cubic model just a little bit better fit, but geez, these are all so close together that they're really all very near to about 0.0 or about 0.8. So in reality, quantitatively, they're virtually the same. Okay, not much difference. It's not like looking at this example here where we went from an R squared of you know 0 0.07 and then we jump up to an R squared of 0.94. That's an extreme example. Here they're very, very close. But again, the closer it is to one, technically, mathematically speaking, uh, that model fits the, the original data just a little bit better. All right, so the last thing we want to think about here, and this is often very important depending on the purposes of your regression and why you were doing it. So we're going to end with a statement here that's really important, and that is just kind of thinking about this reasonably. So however, reasonably speaking, And let's even be more specific here. What I'm referring to here is for predictive purposes. So what we saw was predicting for uh, additional numbers of cigarettes per day, like going out to 55, or if we wanted to go out even higher. For predictive purposes, what we saw was something kind of disturbing with the cubic model. The cubic model, and 
even even in the quadratic model, eventually we would have seen the same thing. So I'll put that in parentheses. And eventually, the quadratic model But the cubic model especially, you know, it changes from the decreasing trend, which makes sense. So it changes from decreasing back to increasing. That makes no sense. So that makes no practical thinking about the data practically, that makes no practical sense for predicting, uh, we'll say, babies' weights from mothers who smoke larger numbers of cigarettes. Okay, it's crazy to think that all of a sudden at 55 or 60 cigarettes are going out even further, that all of a sudden the babies start to have stronger and, and heavier birth weights. That really wouldn't make any sense at all. So what we were seeing here with the cubic model, it's right here on the right, it was starting an upward trend and really the quadratic model was as well. If I took the window and I moved it out, let's say to 100, That'd be a lot of cigarettes per day, but just I want you to see the graph. The line keeps the downward trend. The cubic model very disturbing as it turns up very quickly for predictions. And the quadratic model here was starting to level out and then eventually it too would increase. So for predictive purposes, you know, just beyond the original data set, you know, these three models were virtually the same within the data. But if we want to use it to make predictions, cubic model very bad, quadratic model not so good either because it is just kind of leveling out here. But the linear model, even though it had the lower r squared value by just a little, it keeps that downward trend that really makes the most sense. So I think in conclusion here, I would say just thus, the linear model is probably the best, especially for predictive purposes. Now, if we were only talking about you know, making predictions within the original data set. If we were just going to stick to what was happening right within this data, you know, then the cubic or the quadratic is just as good, maybe a little stronger. You can see how close they all look. Um, but if we're going to talk about using it to predict beyond the original data set, then I think our linear model has to win out, even though it's R squared was a little lower than the other two values.